Welcome to episode 63 of the Narrative Wargamer podcast. I am Tony Rhodes, and tonight I'm joined once again by Jonathan Sharpie. Good evening. And joining us tonight, we have another very special guest on the show, one of the friendliest faces in Warhammer and co-host of one of the most fascinating hobby talk shows on YouTube. It's Patrick from The Painting Phase. <laughs> that's That's got to be the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> 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 that was great. Thank you very much. And th- yeah, thanks for inviting me on. Great to be here. Uh, it's it's great having you on. It's um it, it's honestly been pretty great, you know, watching the painting phase grow over the last 12 to 18 months and really seeing yourself, Peachy and Jeff, sort of just really make a name for yourselves in the community. Yeah, yeah, it's been really cool. Um, I think like, yeah, Peachy's had his uh, sort of um, name quite well established for, for for quite a while like being on warhammer tv and and all that sort of stuff but yeah for for, for myself and jeff um uh it's been yeah yeah it's been pretty mental yeah yeah absolutely and it was um it was about this time last year that we got um peachy on um the narrative wargamer podcast as well to sort of talk about his experiences with narrative play and his sort of like hobby journey and the yeah the way he's grown over the years that he's in his time at games workshop and now on the painting phase and yeah that was that was a great conversation so it's uh, it's great to have you on now as well yeah yeah thanks very much um and yeah it's um it's a great opportunity having you here because i wanted to have a, a lovely chat with you about the whole universe of 40k and this hobby that we love so much because i think you're a really fascinating example of a hobbyist who's like effectively new to the hobby in the the sort of age range that a lot of us are these days (laughs) like you're i think you're quite atypical of the kind of hobbyists who perhaps engaged with the hobby in their youth and are now coming back and are a bit older except that you didn't engage with the hobby in your youth and in fact you've only been in the hobby for what a handful of years yeah pretty much like um I mean, when I was in primary school, I think I I had like you know one Warhammer model or 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 something like that. Um, I remember getting uh, like Calgar um, as a as a miniature and being like awesome, um, but then dropped it very quickly and and it really wasn't a, a sort of a, a part of my life um, for a, well yeah for, forever really. Um, I was kind of aware of its existence and like you see the odd space marine artwork and you're like it's really cool and then it just never really crossed my mind to uh, to get back into it yeah but um yeah essentially through um working there a bit during lockdown uh during covid um i i sort of got into it yeah 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 got like a videography job at workshop for a bit um and then left and then started the painting phase and then uh and then yeah here i am yeah baptism of fire <laughs> yeah very much so because so i was just chatting with um with sharpie just before the show about how i feel like you're one of these examples that we hear of where somebody who's basically not in the hobby goes and gets themselves a very traditional adult job for a company out in the world but that company yeah. happens to be games workshop and then once you start yeah. there <laughs> you very much quickly fall down the <laughs> rabbit hole that is the Games Workshop hobby, even though it wasn't something that was previously in your life. And yeah, it's interesting to hear uh, certainly how meteorically, I think, you've fallen into the, the depths of the hobby because, like you say, a couple of years ago, you weren't even really involved in it, and now you run probably one of the you know, most recently successful YouTube channels around Warhammer in recent years. Yeah, like, it's it's insane, isn't it? Like, it's 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 insane um and and i mean i know this is the audio audio only but like you know people if people have watched the show like there's enough product behind me to like start my own shop like it's um it's just ridiculous um uh but equally awesome at the same time yeah yeah like i i vividly remember when i was had like a site induction at games workshop the head of security at the time lovely chap said yeah so you get your staff discount but you'll just buy twice as much 
<laughs> and, spend, yeah. and spend the same amount of money. And I was <laughs> like, nah, I'll be good. And then here I am several years later going like, oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> he was right. <laughs> well, so it's funny how you mentioned like an induction. And I am curious to know, uh, like we're, we're going to talk about this a bit more, how obviously getting involved in the hobby is, is in itself a whole thing, but also learning the universe and coming to sort of, you know, discover the lore and the, the setting of, you know, 40K is itself quite extensive. And yeah. not being a customer-facing role that you're in a Games Workshop, I'm curious as to whether or not you've got any kind of, like, crash course in the universes and the games. Um, Like, no. No, like, the, the lore side of things is in... And, in, in like, Black Library is something that I've only gotten into sort of more more recently i think um and then now that i'm in it i'm like hooked but at the time um no like nothing um like they they give you they give you some models um and then lots of people in the office they have sprues that they would probably throw in the bin so they're just like a new person rocks up and they're like would you like this piece of plastic and you're like yeah and they're like yes got rid of it um so yeah like my my introduction to the hobby was like yeah i worked on the battle report on warhammer plus um so i like i've forgotten it all now but at the time like i was quite good at absorbing uh i was like oh i think it has to be wholly in three inches of this and um <laughs> all all that kind of stuff um and and like really really not much about like the narrative side of things um, but yeah, my introduction to it was was very much through sort of osmosis, really, like filming mm. and editing, especially editing the battle reports. Um, and you learn, you know, the special rules and this, that, and the other, and um, all the silly names for squads. And you're like eradicators. What do they do? Oh, I wonder. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um yeah yeah it was it was it was really fun but yeah the narrative side of thing not not really covered at all until you know like six months ago for me okay so i'm curious then to sort of say or to ask rather like where do you think the first hook i suppose from the law was for you the thing that made you want to sort of dive into a bit more what was the the first thing you really remember as thinking like oh that's interesting or weird or strange or just something that's sort of grabbed your attention um i think because i've i through just before covid i remember starting a D, &D campaign with uh, a group of friends and um and we played that for about a year and a half i think or something like that and it was like a really cool um sort of i, I guess like story journey that we all went on and and we created this sort of like story together um and you have you know you're fighting and it's like oh we killed the lich um and and i bought everyone t-shirts that said liches get stitches when they killed like the big boss at the end <laughs> um it was awesome um and and that i think i let helped me really like connect with um but like playing D and D, like the story side of things, and you know, socializing, and and it gives you a reason to get together and all that sort of stuff. Um, and with 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 Warhammer, I think for me, um, the hook into the narrative side of things was when I saw a, a Wrath and Glory book uh, for sale. Ah, uh, yes. And um, I was <laughs> like, oh my god, D and D in space. Um, wouldn't this be awesome uh and then i realized that i didn't really know a great deal of of the narrative side of things and the story there's you know there's bits that i'd picked up like i know that the astronomican is a thing and i know that the emperor has a thousand uh psychers fed to him and there's a golden throne and this that and the other and you know bits and pieces but i felt like i'd never really lived in the universe if that makes sense yeah. Um, so that was the the Kickstarter for for me to get involved in in the narrative side of stuff. So, Eisenhorn was the first book 
that I that I listen to. I, I, I haven't read any of them. I just listen to them in the car mm. on uh, Black Library. But um, yeah, because everyone says Eisenhower should be your first one. That's a really great introduction. So that's what I did. I mean, I do think. Um, so I, I will say, funnily enough, I've never actually yet read the Eisenhower books. I know, oh, despite really? being someone who has been in this hobby myself for twenty plus years. I've read a lot of Black Library books. I just haven't actually got around to the Eisenhower ones. I've got them on the shelf. I'm going to read them yeah. probably at some point in the near future. But I always hear them cited as like one of the good points to get into 40K or mm. the original Horace Heresy trilogy books. But yeah. I personally don't think that the Horace Heresy is a good starting point for someone who's completely new to the hobby. Mm. Because I think that is... That's almost its own setting in itself. It's not really 40k. It's yes. 30k, and, it, and it's surprising how different they are once you are yeah. familiar with and know the difference. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. My personally, my go-to recommendation for anyone who can get a copy of it is um, 15 Hours. Like that's the book oh, the, that the I guard, always the yeah. guard book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the book that I've read multiple times because I love it. It's one of my favorite little Black Library books. But also, I think it tells the nature of what the 40k universe is. Yeah, so very clearly and so really well. You know, the this life of a guardsman on this backwater, you know, planet that's um, that's been besieged by orcs, and <clears throat> everyone's just trying their hardest to either stay alive or just keep the illusion of the Imperium together and it's all working and it isn't all just actually falling apart around the scenes and mm. um, it's it's brilliant like without obviously going into spoilers for the book itself it's things like in the very first chapter you, you find out that you know like the main character is you know coming of age and has been living on an agri world all his life so he's been working on a farm and then he gets conscripted into the guard when, and then he gets dispatched to a world where his his shuttle, his regiment gets sent there because of a clerical error. <laughs> and then that's yeah. it. You know, like they don't know that. They just think they just think they're going there because that's what the, uh, the the greater command of the Imperial Guard have deemed is where they need to be. But actually they're there through bureaucracy and, you know, <laughs> just administrative errors and all the rest of it. And there's a, a guy later in the book on the planet who like he's really pleased that he got himself off the front lines. He's sort of a Kaifus Kane style character where he's like he's just really oh, glad okay, he's yeah. not anywhere near the fighting but actually he's now a desk jockey working in um, basically the propaganda machine <laughs> and he's constantly looking at all these reports about how badly the war is actually going and every single day he's having to try and find a way to spin it as being good <laughs> like um, and he's he just thinks his job is so much worse there because he knows if he if he gets it wrong or doesn't do it right, he's going to be executed. And it's just as dangerous for him being there oh. as it will be on the front lines versus the orcs. <laughs> um, yeah, some commentar. Which would be like, I didn't like how you wrote that. Bang. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, and yeah, it's it, it's a whole little cast of characters that are involved. And, you know, this it's the whole premise of the book being that 15 hours is supposedly the average lifespan of a guardsman. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, then seeing that, that I'm through gonna, the eyes of that. the guards. Yeah, I'm gonna have to add that to the list. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, but yeah, so if so, if like Eisenhorn was your jumping off point, um, obviously that's Black Library novels, and as you say, you've obviously you read a few now, or you know, listened to a few, and so on. Um, yeah. How much have you sort of? come to know about the setting itself you know and the um i suppose the the wider story as opposed to the like singular novel stories if that makes sense yeah like um oh what is it the uh is it, what watches no watches a thread there's like the custodies novels um mm -hmm. i'm gonna have to get and and it's about like kind of when Gilliman comes back and the Great Rift and all that sort of stuff and yeah what was it the 13th Black Crusade um, so I feel like I've kind of got I don't know I, I know more about you know I, I, I guess a cop out answer I know what I know but I don't know what I don't know <laughs> um, 
Um, but yeah, vaguely, because I think I prefer the smaller stories um, in a way, like, you know, the, the human sort of, and in some cases not human, but um, like the, that kind of side of it more mm. than um, more than all of that. But I'm kind of like, I feel like, yeah, you sort of like, right, Horus her Heresy happened and then, you know, a bunch of stuff. And then now all the Primarchs are coming back and, oh, the galaxy cracked. Woo. <laughs> yeah. Abaddon had a plan all along, it turns out. <laughs> Indeed he did. <laughs> okay, well, um, so obviously knowing now more of the the context of the universe that you've obviously picked up from um, like the Black Library novels and so on. Um, yeah. What would you say is like some of the like fundamentally unique 40k things, if that makes sense? Like, if you're going to look at the uh, the like the universe and sort of try to identify something that's very uniquely 40k, does anything spring to mind for you? I mean, I know, I know, we talked about it a little bit um, beforehand, but yeah, like the silly words um, <laughs> yeah. and, and and everything. I think, I think that's that. That to me is is something that is like they don't have torches; they have illuminators or illuminators or um, something like that. Like the use of language and and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, they don't. Um, they don't. They don't have a watch. They have a chronometer. Yeah, yeah, depending on you know who who's writing it. Um, yeah, that's it, and it changes yeah. from like um, like book to book as well, doesn't it? Um, I think it's so it's so difficult in, to answer in a way. I like I like I'm just like well, I, like all of the ones that I've read, they all feel 40k, even though they're all so different. And I, I think the way they blend like technology and magic and gods are totally real like it's just all so mental but it all fits together and makes sense uh, yeah he's is, is my is, is kind of like my takeaway from it like you have it's like oh you know the the dark age of technology and age of strife and this that and the other and they're like right cool yeah they were way better at technology than us and we're trying to refine all these uh um all these technologies and called tanks and this, that, and the other. And, and then it's like, Oh, here's a demon lady. And Oh, here's someone that is uh, a blank. You know, they don't have a psychic presence. So I'm going to use them as a weapon. You, you just take it all for granted. Like they throw so much stuff at you, but you just like, yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's got a very unique sort of mixing of technology and mysticism, hasn't it? Um, I mean, the, one of the, like big parallels of the universe as a whole is the idea of um reality and then the warp mm. and like the the warp itself is this um very all pervasive concept because it doesn't just mean chaos like the warp no. you know is like a natural phenomenon more so than even like the uh, malevolent entities that live within it and you know the warp is used for lots and lots of things by the Imperium. They're so dependent upon it. I mean, you mentioned mm. earlier, like you know the Astronomicon, like the Imperium would fall apart without it. The Astronomicon being basically this, you know, psychic lighthouse beacon that literally all the ships in the Imperium use to navigate, because one of the fundamentals of their travel is warp travel. <laughs> yeah, which. You know, compared to other sort of sci-fi franchises where, yeah, you've got light speed or um, hyperspeed or whatever, and it's, they'll be, <laughs> in, in those examples, they'll be talking about making complex mathematical equations or using supercomputers to make sure when traveling that fast, you don't fly through a sun, you know, an asteroid field or something. That's, yeah. that's the extent of the danger there, because you're just traveling really fast. But... In 40k, <laughs> these ships literally rip a hole in reality and travel through a hell dimension in order to effectively yeah. jump via wormholes <laughs> through, yeah. through warp rifts. Yeah. yeah, it's great. And and the way they kind of talk about it, um, 
like the tides of the warp and, mm. and it's like oh like like proper sort of like adventurer like sailing the the seas and and that kind of thing like it's it's, it's surprisingly nautical in nature isn't it rather than yeah. like sci-fi you know this idea that yeah there's turbulent you know um waves in the in the warp you know at times certain warp routes are more hazardous than others the ships literally require navigators you know people yep. who are specialized in being able to you know read and see the changes in the warp and navigate them and at the same time the thing is full of predators it's not just uh, you know a highway and you're avoiding traffic <laughs> like <laughs> there's these uh, warp entities that are literally out there to try and you know get through the geller fields and basically <laughs> devour everybody on board or drive them mad or horribly mutate yeah. them or it, it's it is uh it is by no means a, a safe way of traveling but it remains the most brutally efficient <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and just like how vast the galaxy is, like when uh, I think it was like Eisenhorn was like, "Cool, yeah." So we, we were gonna hop into the warp and and go over here, and we were in there for like thirty weeks. And you're like, "Oh right," and and that's fast. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> the universe is huge. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's one of the things that stands out to me is kind of the vastness of the universe. Uh, how what how much variety there is in there. How you can meet a character that's like lives on a world and has no idea what else is going on in the in, in the Imperium and yeah. yet you'll meet another character who's slap bang in the middle of a world that's being ripped apart and the forlorn nature of the galaxy I suppose for me the unique selling point is kind of the the, the deliberate ambiguity you get across all the factions because mm -hmm. with a lot of sci-fi it's, it's very black and white isn't it it's like this is Star Wars you like the Jedi's you shouldn't really like the Sith Okay, whereas whereas you dig you dig deep into the the forty k universe and you're like, well, clearly the humans are the good guys because we're humans. And then when you start digging a bit deeper, you're like, well, actually, yeah, well, I'm not so sure. I do agree with with everything they're talking about, and that and that for me is what the, the kind of the unique selling point of the of, yeah. of the universe is because it's like actually, I I actually think those death robots that are waking <laughs> up and claiming their galaxy back, they're the ones that did it right. Not not the race that supposedly like me, so I think that's the thing that that sells it for me. That's such a good point. Yeah, well, you could probably guess from that that Sharpie's a Necron player. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, come back I, and I, enslave everybody. Yeah, I love the Infinite and the Divine. I think that's probably one of my favourites. Um, really, really fun. And yeah. and yeah, I think that's it. Like, because there's no. There's no good guys in 40k. That's kind of like one of the one of the taglines yeah. that even like Workshop use, isn't it? But then you like right. Well, the system's bad, but there's like cool individuals in there. Like yeah. I can still read, listen to a guard book and be like and root for them. Um, but then equally, I can I can. I mean, the Night Lord trilogy. I was like, yeah, come on, you can do this. Um, you can skin all those people. And then I'm like, oh no! <laughs> like, oh wait, what am I rooting for here? <laughs> yeah, and and then like, was it? Um, you know, the Black Templars are like pretty nuts, but then Grimaldus mm. giving his speech on on like the walls of Armageddon, and I'm like, oh, I've never wanted to kill orcs so much. Um, <laughs> yeah, like I find myself whoever I I root for whoever's perspective I'm. Um, yeah, and to be fair. The universe does a really good job of that, uh, and the setting does a really good job of that, because at the end of the day, all these factions are playable factions in the game. And the idea is, obviously, if you're playing collecting that army, it's chances are it's because you enjoy like rooting for that faction, as it were. You know, in like whether it's because you just enjoy the way they play on the table, or the way the models look, you know, the law behind mm. them. I mean, like, for the... <laughs> For the longest time, I find uh, I found the Drakari a fascinating concept as a species, you know. And like, I used to have a Dark Eldar army back in second edition, uh, not second edition, third edition. Um, but like, you can't morally root for the Dark Eldar. 
<laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> not. Not exactly something that you could be like, yes, I, I am fully on board with their philosophies and think their way of life is entirely justified and morally correct, because it just isn't. Yeah. But that doesn't change the fact that they're a very cool model range and a very cool race within this setting. And like I said, what they bring is still some really interesting and fascinating, you know, characters to play around with in the universe. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> it's it's very hard not to root for the orcs as well. Like, whenever you, you're reading or watching or playing anything from their perspective, because they yeah. almost just hype it themselves to the point of like they're having a good time. <laughs> yes, like I haven't I haven't listened to any orc books. Like I've heard like brutal cunning is is really good. Um, I, um, the... I played Shooters Blood and Teeth recently. Like like, like the side scrolling like orc shooter oh yeah like the, the metal um, slug sort of style game yeah yeah it's like metal slug 40k and that's just so silly like you you get your hair squig stolen at the start of the game and then the rest of it is you just trying to get it back <laughs> and you're like cool yeah and you fight a load of guards then you move to space marines you blow up a bunch of tanks and a knight and you're like yeah it's great <laughs> Yeah, like um, earlier, well, I'd say this year, last year now, um, I listened to um, Gazgold, Prophet of the Bar, um, which yeah. was a great book. Um, again, just because that <laughs> the, the, the framing device for that story is um, it's a Ordo Xenos Inquisitor who has captured and is interrogating Makari. Yeah. <laughs> in order to get an account of basically Gazgul's uh, like life story, you know, to better understand him, you know, and therefore be able to defeat him. But yeah. the, so it's it's an interrogation where the scenes of Gazgul's life are being retold in flashbacks from Makari's point of view as he's following him around. Yeah, and like so it's ostensibly an imperial book because it's obviously from an inquisitor's point of view but mm. the framing device to sort of understand what it is to be an orc and trying to be a human understanding what it is to be an orc was really fascinating and fun and um yeah it's like there's um that sounds awesome if, yeah there's um <laughs> so there's a fun character in it who basically is like the translator um, because Makari doesn't speak Gothic, he just speaks Orcish. Yeah. Um, so the translator is a Blood Axe Orc, who <laughs> he, he's he's basically there because he's you know he he's being paid you know, um, and the Inquisitor is allowing him to be there to translate. That's that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, and and it's really funny as well because like he's. He's obviously interpreting things from a Grot's point of view to an orc. So there's a few times where they, this orc is called—I think he's called Stabbers—is <laughs> his name. Um, oh, and there's a few, cute. yeah. Um, and there's, there's a few points in it where he's like, he's almost trying to like mull over what Makari said and trying to work out how to phrase it. Because like, it's what he's just said is like a very sort of like Grot thing to say. It's not a very orky thing. <laughs> so even like he's like interpreting a little bit of like what Makari is trying to communicate and then he's basically trying to converse it into Orc and then into Logothic. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's uh, it's really good. Yeah, um, that sounds awesome. Again, I'll add it to the list, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the list is endless. Like, it, that's one thing which when I try to explain to basically like non-hobby you know, friends or family or whatever. And uh, and if ever you base someone ever asks you like, oh, who's your favorite author? Or like, what what do you like reading the most? I was like, well, realistically, I just read Black Library because there's enough of it that I don't need mm -hmm. other <laughs> authors yeah. and novelists in yeah. my life. Like, yeah, the only other for me personally, the only other things I'm sort of really passionate for and read throughout my life are all the Discworld stuff by Terry Pratchett. Yeah. It's fascinating how much stuff there is and just how large the universe is and how all these factions have wonderful and interesting stories. 
um, that they can tell. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's, it's it's awesome. Yeah, and it's like yeah, you can be. Oh, I want human. I want god. I want space marines. I want aliens. And like I, uh, I've only listened to one of like the crime novels, but I really enjoyed that as well. Um, and and that was quite quite good at sort of uh, getting into again, like you know, feeling like you live there, like in the city. Was it Varangatua or whatever it's called? Um, and they end up going into a servitor factory, and you kind of experience how a human is servitorized, and you're like, oh, that's grim. But I can't stop listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, so that's actually um, an, in, an interesting part I was going to ask about. Um, so obviously, the the Space Marines are very much, you know, the poster boys of the setting. And mm. presumably, like you say, when you started out and you were sort of working on Battle Report and all the rest of it and kind of absorbing things a bit by osmosis, as you say, I'm interested to see how your initial impressions of what a Space Marine was contrasts to what you now know a space marine really is <laughs> if that makes sense yeah yeah because because you see them and and i guess like after halo and everything you're like oh like a power armored savior of humanity this sounds awesome fight those aliens um but then that's i remember being told oh yeah they have this kind of like one of the gene seeds that gets installed, they can uh, they can spit acid if they want to. If they bite into the flesh, they can get their memories. And I'm just like, what? Um, so learning about that was pretty weird. And then you're like, oh yeah, and they're genetically enhanced like child soldiers, and they've been indoctrinated, and and they don't like they almost have a contempt for humanity, like some of them. Um, and and you're kind of like, oh. Oh, that's a bit weird, but then also, also interesting because of it. Um, and you know, Armageddon and Grimaldus—that was a like a really fun story, but really interesting. Like how he just doesn't get humans like at all. Um, he can't really like communicate with them particularly well, um, and the things that they hold dear. He's, he's like, oh, they're like, oh, uh, Grimaldus, uh, St Steve's dead. And he's like, oh, how did he die? And they're like, well. And they're like, oh, all right, nice one. Um, <laughs> yeah. There was a, what is it, a line where they, so like a space marine comes up to Grimaldus and he's like, oh, I heard that so-and-so space marine's death wound was, oh, I can barely bring myself to say it, in the back. <laughs> <laughs> they just like just you're just like who he's dead like who cares how like orcs killed him does it matter um but to them it does like and that's that's kind of like their whole thing yeah yeah the they're a really fascinating dichotomy of being these you know like angels of the emperor you know these saviors of humanity the the greatest sort of you know like enhancements and weaponry and armory is given over to them in order to protect humanity against the encroaching darkness yeah but at the same time like you say they're they're recruited from sort of like the most brutalist harshest like worlds and environments and they are essentially they forego their humanity in order to become weapons that can protect it they have no empathy they have no real connection with the race that they come from they are completely mm -hmm. devoid of it they are especially when viewed through the lens of other species they are monstrous <laughs> you know? yeah like yeah. they are brutal they're you know relentless you and that's even it doesn't have to be things like the flesh terrors or the space wolves or anything like that to have this sense yeah. of dread to them like i think I've said before on the podcast, one of my favourite Hammer and Bolter episodes from Warhammer Plus is the one where it's from the perspective of the Eldar craft world being invaded by yeah. the Ultramarines. Yeah. And it's like, it's a story of 
this, you know, child who escaped a massacre and came back later in adulthood to try and find the soul stone of his mother and recover it. And, like, the massacre that he's recalling and remembering um, is of these ultramarines that are just, yeah. you know, butchering this craft world and purging it because they're an alien race. And that's the only reason why these gigantic, to them, alien monsters are coming through and destroying their way of life. Yeah, yeah. And I, I feel like when that came out, a lot of that was kind of missed. I think lots of people were complaining about how silly the Ultramarines sounded and looked and stuff. And it's like, you know, the perspective of, you know, they're portraying them as just like, shut up, alien, shoot. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was really interesting. Um, I realise as well, I've been going like, ooh, Armageddon. Uh, the planet was Armageddon, wasn't it? But it's Hell's Reach. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so the <laughs> in that case, the it was Hive Hell's Reach um, in yeah. the third war for Armageddon. Um, yeah. The, yeah <laughs> that all those events were taking place in. Um, but yeah, it's... And one thing that I think the setting does really well also is actually how diverse and varied the Imperium is, like humanity in all its many aspects. I mean, even just on the tabletop these days, you've got the Astra Militarum, and then you've got the Adeptus Mechanicus, and then the Space Marines, the Custodes, and the Sisters of Battle, and like, it's actually a really diverse um, ecosystem as it were. There's so many different aspects yeah. to humanity and not even all of it is obviously represented on the tabletop. You've got things like the Ecclesiarchy isn't massively represented outside the Sisters of Battle themselves. Um, and then the Administratum and even the Astra Telepathica, the Navigator households, the Inquisitors. Yeah. Like, There's so much to it. Like, what would you say are some of your like favorite elements of the Imperium as a whole that you've learned about or discovered? Oh, I mean, I, I, I really like the Custodes. Um, and those, those novels that I listened to, how they were sort of like started off quite, they were like, we had one job and we failed and we're all really sad. <laughs> um, and I'm like, oh, oh, okay. Um, so that that was really interesting. I think the Inquisition is is endlessly fun. Just all the stuff that they get up to and how some of them like they all end up being a bit bad or or what have you. Uh the Commissariat. Um, you know, I'm a massive fan of of like the Kyphus Kane uh like novels and then Gaunt being the commissar as well. And just sort of like their so kind of like separated but not and integrated in, in quite an interesting way um yeah it's mainly like the the like you say like the, the different elements of of humanity and the different roles and um responsibilities that they all have like what is it the assassinorum uh oh yeah 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 and they're just like yep yeah, uh, not a fan of that person right well i'm murdered um and, I think, and that's, that's pretty fun. I think one of the funniest things I always find with the um, the Assassinorum is the amount of times in the law where assassins show up to either deal with a target that has either been long dead or has since moved on, or they turn up and they deal with one thing, but then that's really not the real threat anymore <laughs> because of how long oh, it right. takes to because of how long it takes to commission an assassin. Yeah for it to get oh, approved cool. and then to get to the war zone and all the rest of it um i, I think it was um i think it was famously on um it might it might have been vigilous i can't remember but there was one of these sort of like world settings in recent years where they had this vindicare eventually showed up on the planet um and was like yep yeah, i'm here to kill the war boss like, that's what I was hired to do. You know, there, there was this awkward boss and he's dealing with, and all the Imperials basically like, but we've, we've, we've more or less weathered the war now. Like, the war's kind of been broken now because they're too busy fighting the Tyranids that showed up. 
Like, <laughs> could you? <laughs> like, and he's like, well, I'm here to kill the war boss, so I'll go do that. And he does. Like, and then comes back and he's like, right, problem solved. I'm off now. And like, could could you not hang around and deal with this? Like, <laughs> can you deal with that hive tyrant, yeah. please, or this brood lord, or you know, there's been this gene steel uprising, and we need someone to deal with the majors that's you know masterminding it all. And it's like, no, I wasn't hired to do that. <laughs> Bye. Oh yeah, I mean that, I mean, and and it's like that's very forty k, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All the bureaucracy, and I think that's what makes it so believable as well. Is, yeah, actually, you know, there's, com- computer says there's... no, or sorry, no, my boss said I can only kill the green one. Yeah. <laughs> there's um, yeah, there's so many aspects of it where it isn't all like heroics and last chance you know surviving against the odds and stuff like that a lot mm. of it is quite often just fighting off the inevitable like yeah um the what was it like again two of the big dichotomies between tabletop and the lore of the universe particularly around space marines and tyranids is the fact that the majority of wars and conflicts of the tyranids are just inevitably won by the tyranids <laughs> Like, yeah. most of the time, it's the worlds just trying to fend off and survive as long as they can, or fall back to regrouping more reinforced worlds and try and break the Tyranid advance there. Like, by the time the Tyranids have shown up and got to devouring a world, Imperial forces are... reinforcements are not going to get there in time. So instead, yeah. all they do is they, set, they go and set up blockades ahead of the Tyranids and just wait for them to get to them. Because they can't go out rescuing all the worlds that are currently besieged. No, yeah. And cool. and then to that end, the opposite end of the scale is that the Space Marines are so rare a sight to actual members of the Imperium, and there's mm. so few of them across the Imperium compared to the size of it, that it's not like every other person in the world has a space marine army like you do in in reality and, the, and every yeah. other game you play is probably against space marines in some shape or form the majority of conflicts in the universe do not feature space marines because yeah. there's so few of them out there yeah yeah it's, it's wild isn't it like um yeah i remember being told that being like yeah like some people don't even know they exist <laughs> yeah some people think they're just myth and legend yeah, yeah, and like I mean, um, that's um, that's another one that I always think is a really interesting concept that a lot of people, when they first get into the hobby, or certainly when they first start learning about Horus Heresy, is they don't quite comprehend just how big a period of time ten thousand years is. Mm. Like, because we ju- we just sort of see it as like that's the prequel, and this is the current sort of storyline. Yeah. But You've got to think, like, to us right now in the real world, as it were, 2,000 years ago was the Roman Empire. <laughs> yeah. And, like, that seems like myth and legend. Do you know what I mean? Like, we know so little about what actually life was like. I mean, obviously, we do know a lot from archaeology and all the rest of it, but compared to actually having lived through it, it's yeah. all myth and legend. You know, everything that comes from, you know, the Greek odysseys and all the, you know, tales of the gods and everything like that. That's from only, you know, that's from a period of less than 10,000 years ago in real history. So to the people of the Imperium, the idea of the concept of the Primarchs, these figures from 10,000 years ago, they are literally, they are literally like gods stepping out of myth, you know. Um, And that's why even characters... Like, I mean, even like Dante, who I think at this point is meant to be like 1200 years old. He's an old boy. Like, he's he's a living legend, as it were, because again, he's been around for more than the lifetime of of several generations of the average imperial citizen. Yeah. Um, it's, It's mad to sort of really think about how much time they're really talking about with the universe and like all the events running through it which is why things like the infinite and divine is such a fascinating concept when these necrons have just been they've just been milling around doing their own thing for those ten thousand years and the imperium is just inconsequential to them 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that their their view of of time was was really fascinating. Um just being like, "Oh yeah, humans, whatever." Like they'll come and go and this that and the other like fine. Like like you say, yeah, inconsequential to their own goals, which was just sort of either collecting stuff or yeah, educating be, themselves. It was brilliant. It'd be like things like um Oh, I need to be ready for when that happens in 245 years. I must start getting ready for it now. Yeah. It's just like, it's 240 years. You don't have to get ready for it yet. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. And and just how unfathomable that is. But then also, if they get into a bit of a scrap, they can, like, go into slow motion. So, yes. um, just their view of time and how it was done differently and, and everything was, was awesome. Yeah. Was it like Trazen that, that, and again, I guess trying to avoid spoilers for anyone listening, like at some point has to be quarantined and he's in there for like 200 years. Yeah. <laughs> like I can't yeah. remember the exact figure, but he's just like, oh, this is so boring. Um, yeah, what am I going to do? Then, yeah. And, then, and you're like yeah. you meet one of his, um, He's at some stage has a helper that's a human, but you meet him on like the last day of his service, and you're like, "Whoa, how much time has passed? Like this is crazy." Yeah. Uh, but it's just for a human, it has. But for for Trazen, he's just been like in a basement studying. Yeah, it, it, that's yeah, that's a really interesting scene as well, isn't it? Again, like without going into spoilers, this idea that Trazen. He's talking to his, his aides coming in, and he's like, "You know, my lord, it's my last day today." <laughs> and he, and yeah. he's like, "Last last day of what?" He's like, "Being in your service, my lord, or like and retiring." It's like, weren't you only just like for like like in the you, prime of your youth, like the other week? <laughs> it's sort yeah. of like Trazen's opinion of it, isn't it? He's like, "Did I only just hire you recently?" Sort of thing, <laughs> and he's like, "That that that was eighty years ago." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and he's like, "Oh, I've trained up my son." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love the Infinite Divine. So good. Yeah. Well, um, perhaps then, outside of uh, Necrons and the Infinite and Divine, what would you say is some of your favorite or like most interesting aspects of the Xenos races in the universe? Because again, they're a little different to the sort of typical cast that you get in you know, your Marvel films or Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is where I kind of, like, fall on my uh, behind a little bit, really, because I've generally kept things in, in what I've read um, towards, like, the human elements of it because um, I sort of wanted to feel like a human in, in the 41st millennium first. Um, mm. Infinite and Divine got recommended to me and people were saying, you know, it's not just a good 40k book, it's just one of the best sci-fi novels that you will read. And I was like, alright, cool. I'll give it a go. Because, um, like I say, like, I, I approach things from from like, oh, if I was to play Warhammer D&D, &D, what, would, what would I do? What would a cool story be? How What could, would people connect with? And um, went down i went down the human route first so honestly i i i haven't um listened to any other xenos books yet so a couple of walk ones are on there but like from eldar point of view not a clue um this is it like i'm like i know what i know but don't have a clue about anything else well perhaps um, then um if we sort of rephrase the question then um what do you think would be the next bits of like a Xenos law that you'd like to dive into and learn more about. Oh, okay, yeah. So, like the fall of the elder, I think is really interesting because that they're, they're always like a dying race is is like how they're described, isn't it? So, mm. I think that that would be that would be fun and probably quite educational. Um, some of the orc books. But then sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't know if I could listen to uh, an entire book of uh, people yelling at each other in Orkish. <laughs> um, 
like reading it might be might be a way to go on that one. I, I don't know. Like, do you, do you think you could read it without doing an orc voice as well? Because I think I'd be like, "Oh yeah, boys, come on!" All the, all the way through. Yeah, yeah, constantly. Like, yeah, I, I wouldn't not be able to because it's just just goes with it, doesn't it? I've heard mixed reviews about like. I mean, I know the Space Marines, but like, like say, like the Death Card novels. If they're Black Library, everyone just sounds like they're being like choked all the time. Um, <laughs> so I don't. I'm not super keen to start on that. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, Eldar, probably the next one. I don't think I'm that fussed about Tyranids, to be honest. And everything's generally told from the human perspective from Tyranids, aren't they? Mm. So. Yeah, Tyranids are an interesting one because I also find it, I don't want to say boring because it's not boring, but like ultimately 99% of the time the Tyranids motivation is just to eat things and move on and eat more things. Like yeah, I don't, I don't feel, violence. yeah, and I get it um from you know telling the point of view of this like you know predatory creature being and basically being the ultimate representation of the relentlessness of the cycle of life <laughs> that is the yeah. tyranids um but i don't i never find them overly that compelling for like narrative reasons if that makes sense because they don't have much more like to that their, their biggest narrative spin is being this cosmic horror and again being the victim of the tyrannid invasion and how mm. you're avoiding it and evading it like if anything mm. the most the most intricate part of tyrannid law is probably more the gene stealer cults and actually yes. how yeah they that i would be interested to in. me yeah i think the the best um piece of um writing that i've seen about the tyrannies there's a there's a great short story as part of the eisenhorn um books i think it's in i think it's in the last one in magos where the you, you the short story introduces a key character uh, and it's a short story about an investigation into some some deaths and it, it turns out that it's it's i'm not going to spoil it so, some tyrannid and it kind of gives you a really good feel for how like sort of horrible that is because it it's not a particularly big tyranny, but it's literally like killing a population, and they go hunting this this tyranny. And I thought that was really good in terms of giving you a, a, a nice perspective of how how sort of big and horrible that is when you've got like a, this tiny little tyranny running around like slaughtering people, and they can't quite catch it and kill it. And I enjoyed that more than some of the other sort of big pieces, which, like you say, just like oh, and there's a relentless tide of more tyranids. Here they come. Have they stopped? Of course they haven't stopped. The tyranids, they're coming. They're coming, still coming. So, yeah, I think that was better. I really yeah. enjoyed that. I can recommend that. Oh, cool. Yeah, I get that's another sort of like table misconception is the idea that there are small tyranids. Because really, yes. outside, of, outside of rippers, there really aren't. Because, yeah. again, when you imagine how big a space marine is on the tabletop next to mm. like a hormagaunt or a termagaunt, it's like, yeah, the Space Marine's bigger than them. But that's because the Space Marine in his power armor is meant to be, like, nine feet tall. Like, that Hormagaunt is still the size of, like, a German Shepherd or, like, a big German Shepherd. You're like, a big yeah. dog. It's like a wolf, you know, sort of size. Like, it's the sort of thing where if it, if it jumps on a Guardsman or a human, it's as big as, if not bigger than them. <laughs> and that's... A termagon or a hormagon, you know. What I mean, like they, mm. they're basically raptors. <laughs> like they're, yeah, yeah. They're, they're basically velociraptors, like that sort of scale of a pack of them, and every single one of them is that dangerous to what you would call a standard imperial citizen. <laughs> it's only when they're cast against the backdrop of space marines and titans and everything mm. else that is forty k that they seem par comparatively tame by comparison. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I don't. As, I don't. Have there written any books about the Votan? I mean, I don't know a great deal about the Votan. I know they're the kind of the new kids on the block. So I, I suppose, from my point of view, I would quite like some story to sort of get me into to that kind of. I mean, I know a little bit about the law from reading some of the, the stuff, but um, 
you often sort of get. I mean, I always think that like um, Games Workshop have, are just creating like addicts, aren't they? Because like you know, you always want that next model, and then uh, you know, I I bought a Black Library book and I read it, and then like I was like, oh, I've got another addiction now because. Because I'm going to just keep buying Black Library books now, and and you know I read them from different perspectives all the time. But I've not mm. really got much of an idea about the Votan, and I'll be quite interested to see how that's they're going to sort of fall into the galaxy as it is now. Um, but I'm not aware of a book. Um, there might be, but um, I, I'd be quite interested to see how that pans out. Yeah, currently I don't. Th- yeah, like likewise, like I don't think there is one. Like I've just like typed into my computer like Votan novel. Hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, I and feel like saying, does one exist? And everyone's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there might be some small tie-in short stories uh, for things like when, um, like the Kill Team sets have come out and stuff. That might be about that specific little crew of yeah. Votan. Yeah. Uh, but again, they'll be like web stories and just short stories. Um, mm. Not a, certainly not a novel that I'm aware of yet. I imagine it'll be on the horizon, perhaps. Once they've expanded the range a bit more, because yeah. the Votan is still very much in that first wave release, and I imagine in the next twelve to eighteen months we'll probably see an expansion of their range, the same way that like the sisters, you know, got a sort of two part stage their release. But mm. yeah, the Votan are a really interesting. Um, I don't want to say addition because obviously they're not an addition, they're a revival, they're an evolution of what they were within the setting. Mm. Um, I don't know how much you know, Pat, about the Votan as a species. Oh, because, yeah, because they were like the squats, weren't they? Like, back in the day, uh, and got booted out. But yeah, they they have like AI, is that right? Um, Yes. And they are equals among like the robot versions of them or equals among them in their society and stuff like that even though it's quite on the models all of the robots are in like subservient like roles it's like here yeah. robot carry this carry this heavy thing um which is quite funny um yeah and they're very very secretive and untrusting of of everybody and all that sort of stuff aren't they? yeah they're, they're really they're really interesting because basically the Votan are actually closer to what humanity was during the Dark Age of Technology than what the Imperium is now. Because yeah. essentially, the Votan are... They're, they are an offshoot of humanity. So they're not a Xenos breed. They are a, a stable kind of abhuman. But one yeah. which has been so divergent and independent of the Imperium that they've obviously maintain their own society and are not tied to the fealty of the Imperium anymore. Um, or never were, really, because the, the Imperium being a younger institution than they are. Um, and what's really fascinating about them in the 41st millennium is, yeah, they're, they're two forms of members of society are, yeah, like you say, one, the Iron Kin, which are basically like true AI entities closer to the men of iron um, from the the Dark Age um, yeah. than the, what they have now in the form of like servitors, machine spirits. These are like true AI, but then they are still at a state of mind where they want to coexist with humanity as opposed to having fallen to any Skynet style <laughs> behaviors where they want to overthrow them. Um, and then you have the kin, which are like the main members of the Votan. But what's really fascinating about them is that they're all clones. So they're all sort of like effectively backgrown as a species. And they're not clones in the way that like the clone troopers in Star Wars are clones. What it is, is that the, the Votan have a genetic database. So it'd be like saying if you took a genetic profile of every human on Earth right now mm. and then you had a database of 7 billion different potential, you know, clones you could make. So they're not all identical to each other, but they're all sort of like grown based on a genetic template f- taken from whatever database their particular clan has access to. Yeah. Oh, that's um, cool. 
And then within that, they can genetically manipulate and modify their next generations to be literally bred for certain roles or capabilities or, you know, natural resistances or aptitudes for roles in society. So they're quite... Um, I mean, they're quite structured, <laughs> you know, in um, in the way that they form their clans and their and everyone has their role to play. So, as an offshoot of humanity, they are also semi dependent on psychers. Like they do use a form of warp travel, and they do have psychers in the form of the living ancestors. But it's not a random mutation for them. It's a selected genetic variation that they breed in when they create this next you know generation of Votan and that particular clone will be psychically attuned and they know that and they'll be able to work around that um yeah. so they have a sort of like more stable access to warp manipulation than the rogue psychers that you know standard humans can breed or um propagate <laughs> so they are really fascinating how they've got all this sort of pioneer technology from the dark age and the golden age of technologies but a lot like the imperium now so much of it is lost to myth and um ritualism that it is actual understanding so like their the core of their societies are based around these ancestor cores which are basically giant supercomputer ais but the trouble is while those things are meant to lead the species and help provide all the knowledge they could possibly need, they've been running now for 10, 20, 30,000 years. <laughs> and they basically just don't have the computing power to keep going anymore. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that they're all falling to bits. Yeah, and obviously the Votan don't have the knowledge or the skills or the resources to repair them or make new ones, or generally solve the situation. So they are themselves stagnating and slowly dying as a as a uh, society, but they, like the main branch of humanity, just have to do their best to carry on for as long as they can. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. It's great. Every, every, they all have such cool stories. It's it's such a an interesting deep universe. It really is. Yeah. No. And credit like and it's all marketing to sell toys. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is. <laughs> and it works really well. Yeah. It totally does. <laughs> yeah. Um, I suppose on a. On a sort of just fun light note then, um, what would you say is some of your perhaps favourite pieces of obscure lore or just funny bits of lore or, you know, something that's just surprisingly light-hearted and amusing <laughs> in the setting? Oh, I got, oh crikey. Um, I think oh, I'm going to struggle. I, I, I'm so terrible at thinking on the spot. My mind just goes <laughs> everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Um like so many fun bits in the Kane novels. Um, I think there's just so there's so much to to go out there. Just like just like Jurgen, just following me around with cups of tea. I think that's my favourite thing in the world. Um, <laughs> and and just how he's just completely immune to sarcasm or anything like you find oh we've, we've been on this ship and oh there's this surprise tyranids and g stealers and he's like oh okay um i, I always think that's really fun um oh, fun but i mean there's nothing fun and light-hearted in the night lords trilogy is there <laughs> so <that's> pretty... <laughs> <laughs> like, um yeah, I, yeah, I just think um, I think Kyphus Kane. I, I, it just has to be just in general. Just like there's just so much fun. Um, I've, I've really gotten stuck into them. I, I listened to like three books in a row, and then I was like, oh, fourth one. I was like, oh, I really should listen to something else. Uh, fifth one, and then I listened to like the third um, Eisenhorn novel, and then I was like. Cool, yeah, that was a bit dark. Let's go some, get, go back to something light-hearted and we're back to Kyphus game. 
Um, so yeah, just his relationship with Jurgen is is just phenomenal. I think it's it's uh, it's brilliant. I, I do I do think um, again the way those stories are told I think is really funny. The whole idea that it's his memoirs that are being edited and presented by the Inquisitor that knew him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like really who, interesting way. Of, yeah, uh, who was like romantic, romantically entangled with, and she gets quite like. There's a great line um, where he was like, "Oh, at this point in my career, I was I was done with um, you know romantic dalliances," and she cuts in and she's like, "I should hope so," like insinuating <laughs> that you know they they'd had something going on at that point. And all yeah, that there's um, it, it is funny when uh, she gets slightly jealous of any other like female attention he gets for her throughout the books. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, great. The, there's uh, there's one point where he <laughs> he's obviously becoming quite friendly with this female tech priest, and uh, yeah, he's he he's talking um, about um, the servo arm that she has on like, the McKendrite, um, and <laughs> in, in like one of his memoirs, one of his lines is um, he's talking about he, he's just he's been quite clinical in the description he's giving at that point for some technical reason about something he's describing about how it's in the yeah. life, and he's talking about. She used the McKendrite and blah 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 blah, and he mentions in passing um, that it's a McKendrite that like it plugs in at the base of her spine, um, and, and then like Amberly like cuts in as an editorial note and goes like, Keen fails to mention here how he knows this particular small fact to be true." <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I remember that. It's great, <laughs> and it's it's just it's just quite funny. All these various different little things. So yeah, again, the the Kane novels are are um, famously quite humorous and funny for the setting, and but without breaking the the immersion of it, I feel like I think it does quite a yeah, good definitely feel. Yeah. It does quite a good job of making it still feel like the forty k universe, and it isn't just a series of comedic stories. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Like the the stakes, the stakes are still there. Um, you know, planets are still going to get blown up and, and, you know, get stuck out in life pods and this, that and the other. But I guess, again, it's like the smaller, the smaller scale stories. It's kind of like nothing that necessarily, if, if someone says, oh, 40K, you're like, oh, the Horus Heresy and the Great Rift and this, that and the other. Like, Kaifus Kane doesn't necessarily like go, oh yeah, and he saved the entire universe and elements of it like are like he did really important things that set other stuff in motion and this that and the other but then because he's just sort of like doesn't really think of himself as amazing or or you know of whatever he's it, you're kind of like okay yeah job done on to the next one <laughs> yeah he's just always trying to do his best to just survive and get by um, in his yeah. life in the guard as it were but he he does like ultimately he does do all the things that he's sort of kind of credited for it's just obviously the the story takes on a life of its own and there's exaggerations and retellings and um, yeah yeah and they, his memoirs are more sort of confessionals from him about the <laughs> how he was really thinking and acting in the moment as opposed to how the imperial propaganda machine <laughs> has uh yeah. has, has portrayed his actions yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think mean, yeah, they're they're like my favorite my favorite set of novels. I I, I think they're just easy, uh, easy li- easy listening, um, which which I I really appreciate at the moment. <laughs> um, so perhaps conversely, then, what would you say is perhaps the piece of law or background that you found the most, um, either just sort of like unbelievable or a big twist well not twist as in like a plot twist to spoil book as such but just something which perhaps when you first heard it you're like that can't be true or that can't be right (laughs) you know something that just even for 40k seems a bit absurd or unbelievable um i think i think my first experience of something like that was the in the night lord trilogy and i i guess this is gonna have like a you know spoiler warning ish um if it's appropriate to talk about um when the night lords ended up 
um, torturing a load of astropaths and made this kind of psychic scream that ended up like destroying a planet like it just wiped out all their communication all the astropaths and it was just like oh they can do that that's insane um and then the eldar started chasing him and and it's just like uh, and like even the idea of it existing is mental but then they actually did it um and you're just like oh that's so dark <laughs> yeah um, so yeah, that, that for me was kind of like, yeah, not the kind of lighthearted fun, like, oh, just um, just beat this Chaos Warlord, cup of tea. Um, it's just like, nope, yep, yeah, you're an astropath and I'm going to talk to you and keep you alive for ages and then use all this psychic, screamy torture stuff to like send it down a phone line and explode a load of people's heads. Like, um, <laughs> it's just... Um, just quite like it's hard to put into words <laughs> yeah it's uh it is interesting how sometimes the grim dark as it's as it's known does really manifest itself and i know um like there's there's often some belief that the setting has moved away a little bit from that sort of stuff and mm. some people lament that but I don't think it's moved away from it. I think it's just expanded and there's, there's more variety in options. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's there. Like when, you know, things can get dark, you know, they can be quite intense, especially when you're dealing with, you know, chaos forces and factions and yeah, definitely uh, mal malicious beings, uh, especially the Night Lords. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they're an interesting bunch. And it's weird how, and again, credit, like, Aaron Dembski Bowden's great. Credit to how, like, you know, they're really quite horrible. Um, but you end up sort of, like, rooting for them a bit, in a way. Um, like, and, and again, it's all about, like, the power of the writing, like, whoever's perspective you're sort of seeing it from, they do a really great, great um great job of of making you empathize with them what would you say is perhaps the appeal of 40k over other you know major like sci-fi franchises and so on like what makes 40k sort of so unique to itself compared to your star treks and your star wars oh like like weirdly it feels to me like it feels more real mm. um like there are bad people everywhere and systems are bad and they're broken but there's like good people in the system um i think is is really cool and yeah i mean i, I would agree on that fact like in a lot of the other sci-fi things like like there's like the federation we've gone out into space and all these alien races are our friends and we get on well with them apart from a couple of little you know there's a couple of neo do wells over there who want to fight with us every now and again but for the most part yeah. the galaxy is a wonderful place i somehow yeah. don't feel like that's the case that when we get <laughs> you know should we ever go out there it's probably not going to be a nice place we're probably going to be up against it and i think you're right i think it feels that little bit more real that actually once we get a, an idea of the vastness of the galaxy, it's probably not going to be what we want it to be. No, like, like, yeah, God knows what it, what it would be like. And if it's anything like uh, humanity with itself, yes. um, it, it's like, hey, I want that resource. You've got it in your country. <laughs> Freedom. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> allegedly. Um, so, yeah, I think it, like it, it's, it's so fantastical, but is very grounded at the same time. Um, like, I feel like I could. And I think, like, Marvel, you know, you follow your superheroes. You you never really think about, like, the average human. Whereas 40K, I think, does a wonderful job of going, you know, this is, this is your average human. Here's your, your guard, or here's someone that um that that works on earth for the government and 
and and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think it it just it feels real, it feels grounded, but then you have all of the other cool stuff outside of it as well, and and all the all the aliens feel real, and there's something for everybody, I guess. Like I think you know, I quite like the smaller human stories, and I'm like, oh, this book, this book, this book, this book, but if you like being clad in armor there's a ton of books if you like green skinned orcs going mental and smashing things there's a ton of books um and then there's I models mean, and you can paint them and go i know where this is from um so yeah i think i think that's my that's my answer i think perhaps a really good example of um feeling grounded and real while also being in this so overblown, over top, you know, like environment and setting is probably mm. the microcosm that is Necromunda. Yeah. Because a lot of, you know, the whole Necromundan story arc is these are just people trying to survive in the hive. <laughs> like it's an entire game system and setting of your relatively average human. But yeah. everything in its own 40k way is dialed up to 11. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like I, I play. I've got a corpse grinder, um, cult, like gang, and um, and it's like you know they're given rubbish jobs and they're just chopping up meat and dead people, and it's like no wonder they turn to chaos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they're they're a brilliant example of how sort of like insidious and prone to you know, corruption that chaos and humanity are, like, hand in hand in that way. Because, again, within the lore of the corpse grinder guilds, as it were, um, and gangs, it's not so much like they're corn-worshipping, blood-crazed cultists who are trying to bring about the ascendancy of their chaos god. They're not. A lot of them don't really know that they're worshipping corn. You know, yeah. they, they they call him like the Lord of Skin and Sinew or whatever it is. You know, um, the the uh, Crimson King or something like that. You know, like they have they don't specifically go around putting corn iconography on stuff or all over the place or like even you know shouting you know blood for the blood god and all the rest of it. They're just humans who have been put through such a horrible existence. That they've essentially just uh, they've just mentally broken they've just gone a little bit insane and the way that that's manifested is in this case chaos has gotten in there and it's warped their perception and their reality and mm. it happens to be the blood god <laughs> that, that has done that this time and and then you get the cops kind of guilds uh, cults even which is why they're not they're not chaos hella gangs that's a totally different thing you know they're not Corn worshippers and devotees, they are just these mad psychopathic humans who have succumbed to the voices in their head, which within the setting really are voices in their head, like <laughs> these sort of like demons that are getting in there and um, just really sending them down the path of madness. Yeah, yeah. And again, I, I, I know I've said it so many times, but I'm like, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so much to go at. It's brilliant. It is truly a, an endless... It, it, it's an endless supply of interesting and fascinating stories and environments. And I just... I've been in this hobby now for 20 plus years. And I still don't know it all. I still haven't read all the books. I still haven't, you know, glimpsed everything about every species out there. And, like, there's always something new coming out and more that's been added to it and... In the last yeah. 10 years, you know, even the larger story arc has now started progressing, you know, more and more. And mm. it's not just a, a set one minute to midnight environment anymore. It's we're kind of at midnight now and <laughs> moving through it. Yeah. 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 And that's really interesting. And I, I do wonder where they'll take it and what will happen. And I'm like, oh, like, I can't wait for Perturabo to come back. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd buy that, buy that Primark in a heartbeat, um, and 
yeah, it's interesting like to see where they would go. Um, and also, like, I can't decide if the Primarch's coming back was like the best thing because sometimes like that air of mystery about it, I think, is good. And then you're like, oh no, yeah, gods are real. Here they are. Uh, so, yeah. I, yeah. I I think um, it's I think it's a good thing seeing them back now that the Horace Heresy series of books exist. Yeah, because. Because they were be the you know the details of their lives were being so written down and so yeah. chronicled now by the Black Library that they they sort of lost that level of mysticism to them before they got models. Yeah, good shout. Yeah, like um, Lehman Russ does not have a model, and mm. by all accounts, probably won't have one for a long time yet. You know. Even if he ends up in the next loyalist one, he's probably still going to be another five years out, minimum. <laughs> you know, who yeah. knows? Um, but I wouldn't say like he has any real sense of mysticism to him now because he's been written about in so many of the Horace Heresy novels. Yeah, like you can go read a lot of the lifespan of Russ, you know, through those books. Um, and again, I know lifespan's relative because, like, the Crusade itself is like two hundred years, and obviously each book only tends to focus on a particular campaign or series of events. But like, we know the highlights of his life. You know, we know the weapons he wielded, the company he kept. You know, and if he comes back now, we'll just be like, "Great, he's back!" And now I can actually play with him in my games of forty k. Whereas, if you didn't know any of that. And nothing had been written about him apart from the fact that he was the Primarch of the Space Wolves lost 10,000 years ago. And then all of a sudden Games Workshop gave him a model and rules and wrote a, a, a Black Library novel about him. Coming out of nowhere, that would be a big, you know, mm -hmm. big shift and exciting change. You know, Whereas at this point, we're kind of just waiting for him. <laughs> we know he's going to appear at some point. Is it going to be 2 years, 10 years, 20 years? Who knows? But it's kind of expected that we will get a Lehman Russ model at some point in the future. Yeah. And, yeah, it'll be an exciting day when that happens, won't it? Yeah, I'm waiting for that day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm interested to see all of them come back, you know, and see all the, the models for them and the narrative explanations for them. I mean, like, the lion... Um, coming back in this last year is like a spectacular model but also just like following the law with him is really interesting because it, it's the little things are what i just find so fascinating about it like gulliman coming back initially kind of made sense because if you knew if you knew the setting and you knew the fate of all the primarchs as they were at the end of the horus heresy then gulliman was one of the few ones where it was kind of like concretely known what happened to him. It was like, he's, you know, he survived the, the heresy and the siege of terror. And then, you know, found, uh, wrote the Codex Astartes, uh, split the legions and was around for another couple of hundred years before he got into a fight with Fulgrim who mortally wounded him. And then his body got put in stasis and got taken to a shrine on the crag where you could physically go and stand, you know, in front of Gulliman. Mm. He was basically a corpse emperor in his own right because he was, you know, frozen in a status field, suffering from a fatal wound. So he's not coming back. They can't bring him out of it, otherwise he'll die. But as a member of the Imperium, you could physically go on a pilgrimage to McCrag to go stand before a Primarch. <laughs> so he was sort yeah. of like a known quantity. So it made yeah. sense when they were like, yeah, with story reasons, we can now get him out of stasis and he can heal and, you know, he can go about trying to stitch the Imperium back together now. <laughs> um, but the Lion coming back was this one where his disappearance was all mystery. Like, he was lost when Caliban was destroyed. He had the final climactic battle with Luther and nobody knew where he went or what happened to him and there's been all this, you know, um, myth and conjecture for years of like, was he in the rock somewhere? Was he, you know, was he was he alive? Was he not? Was he lost in the warp or whatever it was? And then when he's come back, like the explanation has been, yes, he was at the time 
asleep on the rock. He was essentially in a coma, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's taken 10,000 years for him to get over that or whatever the trigger is that's, you know, brought him back to consciousness and now he's out in the universe again. Um, but what was fascinating about that is unlike Gulliman, who was in a status field and therefore hasn't aged, they sort of gave us that concrete information about the lion. It was like, oh, he's just been alive the whole time. Which is why he now has like old man face, <laughs> because yeah. he's physically yeah. aged ten thousand years. He's he's not turned into a demon prince. He's not become immune to the you know, the linearity of time. <laughs> he has just been around and existed for all that time. And this is what a prime like for him and his brothers. They probably didn't even know or envision the idea that they would could live for ten thousand years. And yet he's expected to now pick up his sword, pick up his father's shield, and get to work, <laughs> despite being yeah. that, that old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Come on, Grandad, time to go to war. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, you know, being these mystical figures that they are, he's still as physically capable, you know, as he ever was, kind of thing. If anything, he's more tempered and now, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know uh, loads about the line returning, but no, that's really, really interesting to hear about. I think it's fair to say you've, you've started down on a, a pretty epic journey uh, since you know getting into the hobby now, and uh, I, I can probably assume the answer to this. But you know, do you have any regrets, or is it certainly something that you know you are perhaps only regret didn't get into sooner? Yeah, no, I think I think that's a great way of putting it. Um, because there's just so so much to go at. Because um, I think the the building and modelling side of it was always like my my initial interest, um, and then now the lore I find really really fascinating and just great to absorb and get stuck into. Uh, gaming side of things, I'm like way down the list. Um, but yes, yes, like I'm so glad I've done it. It's been really, really fun. I've met so many cool people. Um, and and here we are, like, talking about it. Like, it's great. Yeah, it's... I, I mean, I think one of the, like, best things about this game, as it were, and this hobby is actually the community that it breeds. Like, yeah. the way that intrinsically I can just instantly have something so in common with you know someone who i've never met before or spoken to before and yet we can just talk about this you know, this hobby this game this universe so deeply and so intricately that it's just fascinating to just talk about for literally hours <laughs> yeah yeah it's 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 uh it's it's wonderful like you there's, there's so many avenues and to think about it you know like you know, like i mean i'm sure there's a, a chess podcast out there somewhere but um <laughs> you know for for what is figures and a game to, to just i think the the law side of things has just got is so entwined with it all now that it's like for me it's i i look at you know i've got a custodies army on my desk at the moment that i'm trying to paint and I don't look at them anymore and think oh yeah cool gold people um because that's why I bought them but well ish but it was it was being told oh these are like the bodyguards of the emperor and there's a like a select number of them and they're so cool and they're the elitist fighters and they're in these books and this that and and that just really helps sort of get get sort of sucked into it all and and feel more connected to it as well i think Hmm. i I totally get it like i think to say this hobby is what it is people realistically only really collect the armies they do because they find something about that faction fascinating like Mm. Again, it's a bit a good comparison to something like, you know, League of Legends or whatever. Like, people probably don't play the characters they play in that because of the the preferences for the lore behind that character. They probably play that mm. character because of the play style it has and their ability to, you know, use it to do well with. 
<laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, whereas at the end of the day, most people, even like you know, sort of top end competitive players, probably are, are trying to win with at least one or two of the factions that they like and enjoy. You know, from the law and the setting and everything. Not just because Chaos Space Marines happen to be a strong codex at that period of time. It's probably they have a Chaos Space Marine collection because they like something about Chaos Space Marines. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say that in, initially people pick a faction because of what because of what it looks like. But I suspect uh, anybody who's uh, read any books will, will sort of recognize the fact that you'll read a book and then almost immediately you're invested in in that that faction and you're thinking about what what you can be doing and and then like like i picked my necrons up because i liked um some of the stuff that i'd read not because i was originally an eldar player and because of the rich law i think you know they've got us on a hook haven't they games workshop because the more we delve into the to the to the universe the more the, the more we enjoy it, the more the more money we spend. I mean, I'm making my way through the Horus Heresy books, and um, you know, um, I'm a big fan of Space Wolves. So I've got a Space Wolves army, but every time I read a book about a different one of the the legions, I'm kind of thinking, "Ooh, I actually quite like the Dark Angels." Now I know a bit more about them. Mm. Ooh, I never really thought I'd like the Thousand Suns, but you know, there's they've got a real rich, deep lore, and actually, may, maybe I will pick up some models of that. So I think. So that that law is what keeps bringing us back, doesn't it? it? Keeps us spending spending money on 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 models. So your initial thing might be the way something looks, but the second you start delving into this universe, that they've got the claws into you because you can't step away because you can't say, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop reading this this set set of books because you know I'm getting too invested. I'll read this instead. Oh damn, I've read a Necron book now. Now I'm gonna have to buy some Necron models. I've got to buy Trazen to paint up, or I've got to buy Oricon. Because it, the, the law is so good. Yeah, fully agree. <laughs> and at the same time, you sit there just wishing they would do it, um, an Exodite range. Because you know full well if uh, they did, you'd buy it. <laughs> oh, don't, yeah, don't even start on that one. Yeah, yeah, I was never really that interested in them until I read The Infinite Divine. And I'm like, oh, this is so cool. I want dinosaurs. <laughs> Great. Well, normally, um, at this point, towards the end of the shows, um, I would uh, give the guests an opportunity to tell people again where they are, where they can find them, and the sort of things that they they get up to elsewhere on the internet. And uh, you, you are, of course, more than welcome to do that, Pat. But I think probably a lot of people are quite aware of uh, where they can find you and what you get up to. But <laughs> tell us, tell us briefly about the the painting phase. Uh, yeah. So, so we we. Uh... Yeah, hobby channel on YouTube primarily. We all have our own Instagrams and bits and bobs, but we have like a a rambling chat show. Try and do that every week, and then a bunch of other hobby videos, generally sort of painting focused. Um, occasional bit of gaming and and stuff like that. But we just try and have fun um, and produce some uh, cool videos for for people. Yeah. Excellent. And yeah, if somehow you've managed to find your way here to this <laughs> this podcast episode and you haven't previously heard of or seen anything by the Pains of Viz, definitely go check them out. Um, Pat, Peachy and uh, Jeff are a great bunch. And uh, yeah, if, if, anything that you put up is always a, a great watch. And uh, and yeah, um, Sharpie, <laughs> where, can, where can people find you again? So... Um specifically on instagram that, that's where you'll find all my hobby stuff um i'm i'm suspect you're going to put it on the screen for youtube but for if you've got a podcast yet i'm i'm sharp zero six zero eight and that's my it's my handle on instagram and it's it's solely um hobby stuff and 40k stuff and a bit of blood bowl because that's what i'm into at the minute so uh and as always um you can find me at Narrative Wargamer um, over on YouTube, uh, Instagram, Facebook, just here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> and uh, yeah, if you have enjoyed listening to tonight's episode, then uh, please do uh, either give us a, a five star rating or a like and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. And uh, yeah, if you do want to help support us, we do also have a Patreon as well. Um, so you can go check that out. There'll be links in the description below. 
and it just helps us uh, keep up basically with running costs because as you know Pat there's quite a bit that's actually involved of trying to maintain and run things like a YouTube channel and um, get all your recordings could, done properly and everything. We, we could do another episode just on that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah it's um, yeah it's it, it's highly appreciated the support that we do have from our patrons and uh, yeah. If you want to um, listen to more stuff like this in the future, then yeah, you can find us over on YouTube or uh, just keep it <laughs> keep an ear out for us uh, on your podcast platform of choice. Um, so yeah, uh, once again, thank you, Pat, for coming on and uh, chatting all things 40k law with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, and thank you, Sharpie, for coming in and joining us tonight. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for letting me listen to you. Uh, uh expand the universe and it's great to, <laughs> to talk to you Pat all yeah, the best likewise. with your endeavours uh, and yeah as always um, until next time guys this has been the Narrative Wargamer podcast helping you to discover more ways to play 40k